On behalf of Allergy and Asthma Network, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the November edition of our 2017 webinar series, Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This is Sally Schessler, the Network's Director of Education. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. Our webinars are tied to our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. The goal of our webinar series, which is also brought to you by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, is to share guidelines-based information and resources with you that are relevant to your life and your practice. Today's topic is the asthma yardstick and what it means to both practitioners and patients. We are joined by Dr. Bradley Chips and Tanya Winders. Dr. Chips received his medical degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston in 1972. He was a pediatric resident for two years before serving in the Air Force at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota for two years as a general pediatrician. He then completed a combined allergy and pulmonary pulmonary fellowship at Johns Hopkins and spent one year on the faculty in the Pediatric Respiratory Sciences Division. Dr. Chips has been in private practice in Sacramento since 1979. He is the medical director of the Respiratory Therapy and Cystic Fibrosis Center at Sutter, Med Sutter Medical Center in Sacramento, California. He is also the associate medical director of the Sutter Community Hospital Sleep Laboratory, which he established in 1984. He is board certified in pediatric pulmonology and allergy and clinical immunology. He is currently the president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Tanya Winders is president and chief executive officer of Allergy and Asthma Network and travels throughout the country spreading awareness and preparedness messages to patients, families, and caregivers and work, works with leading experts to build patient-centered collaborative care teams to achieve optimal health outcomes. Tanya has over 17 years experience in leadership roles within the allergy and asthma industry, from sales and marketing to management market access. A graduate of the Louisiana State University where she earned a master's in business administration, she is the mother of five children, four of whom have asthma and or allergies. We thank you both for being here with us today and we'll begin with Tanya Winders. Thank you. And thanks again for having us today. So if we could advance the next slide, please. So today we want to begin by talking about asthma and certainly our understanding of asthma that has, has evolved over especially the last several years. Um, you know, when I first entered into this respiratory disease area and asthma specifically, we thought of it as a single disease. And yet now we know that it's more of a syndrome or a spectrum of diseases that has both environmental and genetic factors causing inflammation, resulting in airway hyperresponsiveness and reversible airway obstruction that results in clinical symptoms such as coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath. But truly we know that thinking of asthma as a single disease does not reflect the heterogeneity of characteristics around asthma. And as our uh, science and evolution of understanding has evolved, we now know that again, there are various different phenotypes of asthma and that is what we'll speak about today with the asthma yardstick. Next slide. So, what is severe asthma and who is the population that is best represented by severe asthma? According to the data, it's estimated that about 5 to 10% of the total asthma population has severe asthma, and yet that percentage of the population certainly accounts for much more of the total overall healthcare costs related to asthma. In fact, some studies suggest that that represents 80, 50 to 80% of the total healthcare costs uh, in regard to asthma, which is currently estimated at $56 billion a year here in the U.S. Next slide. This reflects a study that was in Jackie um, last year in 2016 and came out of Kaiser Permanente in Southern California, where they looked at their patients and their severe uncontrolled asthma patient population and compared both the clinical and economic burden within their non-severe asthma patients to their severe uncontrolled asthma patients. What they found, not surprisingly, is that the severe uncontrolled patients had more asthma exacerbations, short-acting beta agonist use, 
higher overall cause and asthma-related costs than those patients with non-severe asthma. Next slide. The network actually partnered alongside Beringer Ingelheim to develop the Open Asthma Survey in 2016. And this was a survey designed to better understand both healthcare provider and patient attitudes and beliefs regarding asthma control with the goal of identifying potential areas for improvement. Some of the findings are illustrated on the next slide. And again, the slide, the study, before I go into that, was a 20-minute online computer-assisted survey that included both healthcare professionals and patients, and you can see the specific populations here highlighted, 2,900 adult asthma patients and over 850 practitioners. Next slide. In this survey, what, when, when objectively assessed, patients were classified into severity groups. This was done utilizing the NAEPP severity assessment. And the patients, when objectively assessed, 18% of our 2,900 patients actually classified into the severe category. Um, consequently, when we asked HCPs, the healthcare professionals, about their patient population, 16% of the patients were reported to be severe persistent. So again, considerably higher than that 5 to 10% that is most commonly reflected in other studies. Next slide. So what were some of the key findings of the Open Asthma Survey? There were actually three disconnects that were revealed. First, patient's perception of control. Again, we know that patients often underscore their, uh, or overestimate their level of control and underscore their level of severity. And again, this, this survey certainly reinforced that. And then secondly, the impact of asthma, the actual impact on quality of life as well as on activities of daily living. And we'll dig a bit deeper into that data in just a moment. And then thirdly, what was actually happening in routine care asthma visits between healthcare providers and patients? Next slide. So the vast majority of patients certainly believe that they're well controlled or mostly controlled, even among the more severe and moderate patients. And you can see in this particular slide that 20% 26% of severe asthma patients thought they were well controlled, and 65% thought they were mostly controlled. And in the next slide, we'll look at some of the details around how they assess that and also uh, maybe some of the gaps that exist. So within these self-reported groups, we see that those well-controlled patients are actually experiencing symptoms on a weekly basis, and mostly controlled um, patients were experiencing on more than two times a week. So again, the number of days with symptoms over the past four weeks in that well-controlled group um, were the you know one to three to five times. In the mostly controlled group, though, patients said that it was you know having symptoms upwards of six to 10 to 12 times in a four week period before they actually believed that they were only mostly controlled. And most disturbingly, patients didn't believe that they were uncontrolled until they were having symptoms greater than half of the month in the past previous four weeks. Next slide. You can advance one more. So the patients then reported these symptoms, and, the, and we compared that to the physician expectations by classification. And what you can see here is, again, the disconnect. Certainly, the physician classifications of uncontrolled were much less than the patient reported. So again, significant disconnects and significant gaps in those numbers. Next slide. So when we probed a bit, dip, a, a bit deeper into um, how this was actually impacting patients' daily lives and basic 
activity in the severe category, upwards of 76% said it impacted walking, 90% of course running, um, swimming 85%, even things though like basic household chores, laundry and vacuuming were impacted over half of the time. And then when you looked at again the impact of disease on things like attendance at work and school, we saw very high rates of absenteeism and loss of productivity. So again, this demonstrates that clearly the level of severity of disease has more significant impact on activity level. Next slide. Sorry, we can go through those builds. So it was interesting to us because even in this survey, we then asked with these significant levels of impairment and limitations on activities of daily living, are you satisfied with your healthcare professional, your asthma doctor? And in fact, 88% of patients said they were extremely satisfied or somewhat satisfied with their asthma doctor. Next slide. So then we dug a bit deeper to say, well, during those routine care visits, what's actually occurring? Uh, we were surprised that fewer than half of moderate to severe patients say that they always discuss symptoms, and fewer than a third always discuss how asthma is impacting their daily life, and even fewer than that have a, have a very distinctive asthma action plan. So again, in the severe category where you would expect to see routine use of, the, of tools like spirometry, asthma action plans, lung function testing, um, that did not necessarily occur. And more importantly, Importantly, when we got to the softer side of severe asthma, such as anxiety or depression, um, that was rarely discussed, with only 13% of patients reporting that over the last 12 months. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chips to discuss the, the various definitions of severe asthma or uncontrolled, difficult to control asthma, and dig deeper into why some of these gaps may continue to exist. Dr. Chips? Thank you very much. And we begin with the 2007 uh, National uh, Education uh, Guidelines, the EPR3 guidelines. And now in 2014, ATS, ERS, and then finally in 2017, and uh, the GINA guidelines. The GINA guidelines have been around for 15 years now, but they're updated every year. And so this is a living document on their website that is very helpful in asthma management. So we know that in the 2007 guidelines, we had a significantly fewer number of patients with severe asthma. They used uh, FEV1 of less than 60% of predicted and, and a reduced FEV1 to FEC ratio. And that is approximately 5% uh, to their mindset of patients with severe asthma. And of course, we learned earlier that that is in at least threefold lower than what is really present. Severe asthma then requires step five or six care. They have persistent symptoms throughout the day, nighttime awakenings, using short acting beta agonists several times per day, and significant decrease in the normal activities. In the 2014 guidelines, again, looking at patients greater than uh, six years of age, again, the treatment guidelines recommended GINA steps four and five. In the EPR3 guidelines, there are six, six steps for asthma care. In the GINA guidelines, we have only five steps. And that includes high-dose inhaled corticosteroid with long-acting beta agonist or an LTRA or theophylline. And for the previous year to have, uh, for doing that for the previous year, or have systemic corticosteroid greater than 50% of the time in, would, would then prevent them and label them as an uncontrolled patient despite having this therapy. And then we move ahead, it's still in 2014. Uncontrolled asthma was defined with at least one of the following criteria. Poor symptom controls, which means an ACT, ACQ of greater than 1.5 or an, an asthma control test of less than 20. At least two bursts of, of oral corticosteroid or three days each one hospitalization in the regular floor or the ICU, and surely on mechanical ventilation, having significant airflow limitation with an FEV1 or less than 80% of predicted, and in the face of a, of a reduced FEV1 to FEC ratio. And their asthma is controlled 
on uh, oral steroid, but worsens when there's tapering of high-dose steroid or there's systemic, uh, uh, either inhaled or systemic corticosteroid. So in 2017, we see a further alliteration of these guidelines where severe asthma is now defined as requiring step four or five in the GINA guidelines, which are high-dose ICS lava to prevent the patient from becoming uncontrolled or asthma that remains uncontrolled despite this treatment. So we know that asthma is an inflammatory disease. We have uh, ILC2 cells, which, which are innate uh, lymphocyte cells. We also have TH2 cells that produce mediators that cause asthma to occur. Primarily IgE, which you see at the top of the page where their uh, plasma cells do produce specific IgE to allergens. And we have several chemical mediators, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. All of these produce increased mucus production, smooth muscle hypertrophy and hyperplasia, which causes air, which then leads to airway obstruction and airway hyperreactivity. And then, of course, fibrosis and, and modeling, remodeling of the airways. And this, at least in part, is driven by the eosinophil, which will become more important as we talk about biologic therapy in just a moment. So also then we have TH2 type 2 low inflammation. These patients are very difficult to treat. These patients are made worse with cigarette smoke, pollutants, and also chronic infection. It leads to upregulation of mast cells, release of IL-17 and IL-8, which causes a upregulation of neutrophils, an increase in bronchial hyperresponsiveness, remodeling and oxidative stress in airway smooth muscle that's driven by interferon gamma. And this is a group, these are a group of patients who are very difficult to treat and often do not respond well to inhaled corticosteroid. So then we came upon doing an asthma yardstick where we're realizing that the 2007 guidelines were in fact uh, uh, 10 years old, or well, they were nine years old at that time. We needed to update what we were doing for the U.S. population. The uh, adult asthma yardstick was published uh, this year in Annals of Allergy and uh, Immunology. The pediatric yardstick is almost, it's in its third draft right now, and should be presented for publication within the next 30 days. So this is just a picture of the asthma yardstick that was published uh, early this year in, um, again, the uh, Analysts of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. We had a very robust panel that helped us do this, and we're gonna go through some of the findings now that we had in this study. So the asthma yardstick is a comprehensive update on how to conduct a sustained step up in asthma therapy for the patient who is not well controlled or poorly controlled asthmatic. Step up strategies are based upon current guidelines, newer data, and the authors combine clinical experience and are intended to provide a practical and clinically meaningful guide toward the, the goal of controlling asthma. The development of the tool uh, came in response to uh, the need to proactively address the sustained loss of asthma control at all levels of severity. So we know that approximately 50% of, of uh, patients with asthma continue to have not well-controlled or poorly controlled asthma despite using recommended step care. And poorly controlled asthma contributes significantly uh, to impairment of quality of life and refractiveness to multiple medications. And this should be regarded as a signal to review and modify their care, which is very important to do. This qu The question remains then, how do we as care providers help our patients successfully achieve and maintain control of their asthma. So we know that a lot of factors contribute to poor control. I'm just going to summarize this. We know environmental exposures uh, such as allergens, irritants, and viruses can cause a problem. Significant comorbidity, rhinosinusitis, respiratory tract infections, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, and obstructive sleep apnea all play a role. Concurrence of asthma imitators, such as vocal cord dysfunction, can be can be difficult. 
and cause then erroneous diagnosis to occur. In a stu published study by Sean Aaron in JAMA a year and a half ago, a Canadian study of patients who were receiving treatment for asthma when they were in, exposed to a very explicit protocol to determine whether or not asthma was present or not, 30% of the patients or 71% of the patients who were receiving therapy for asthma were not actually asthmatics. So it was an erroneous diagnosis in 30% of the patients. And of that 30%, 71% were exposed to regular medication. Very important. We also know that difficulty using inhalers and poor adherence to therapy are very important uh, obstacles to good care. Cost can be a problem and also lack of, ex of access to health care. So we know that we evaluate a patient who is not well controlled by using a, a validated control instrument, lung function testing, and taking a good history. We address adherence, proper inhaler technique, infection, and environmental control. If it's only for a short period of time, then we can use, uh, uh, they can be satisfactorily treated with short-acting bronchodilator and no step of action is needed. But if they have a prolonged period of time where they are at risk because of increased symptoms uh, with uh, asthma and poor adherence to this, they need to con a, consider a sustained step-up therapy. So that is what we're going to talk about now. So using the GINA guidelines, we know that in step one through five, that inhaled ICS is the backbone of therapy. We know that if you, that between step one and step two, that low dose inhaled corticosteroid is necessary. Also, there is evolving evidence that a short acting beta agonist and an ICS together or a quick acting, long acting bronchodilator with quick action and an ICS may be used at step one even, especially during times of loss of asthma control. But then as we go from step two, three, four, and five, we continue to increase the dose of inhaled steroid. We may add a long acting antimuscarinic, and of course we'll add some of the um, uh, biologic products that we're gonna talk about in just a minute. And of course, as an alternative, but a definitely uh, a definite alternative we have to be very close to pay attention to is the use of oral corticosteroid. So for moderate persistent asthma, the gene is step three to step four. This is a patient who remains symptomatic that is not well controlled using a validated instrument for asthma control for at least two months or experiences two or more exacerbations requiring oral corticosteroid in the past year, despite using a low dose inhaled steroid and a long acting beta agonist or medium dose ICS as monotherapy. And you can also use a sustained release theophylline the or a leukotriene receptor antagonist. So to step up then from that, we have two choices. First, we can add teotropium uh, or, or one of the other long acting antimuscarinics or a small particle inhaled corticosteroid. A long acting antimuscarinic, and there are four in the US market, are proved down to six years of age. The adverse effects are associated with pharyngitis, headache, bronchitis, and sinusitis in adults, and also worsening of narrow angle glaucoma or urinary retention. But by using inhaled uh, teotropium is just as an example of the one of the long-acting antimuscarinics in place, we can see a definite increase in lung function, improvement in quality of life, and decrease in exacerbations. Also, a small particle, uh, one to two millimeter inhaled corticosteroid may be used, uh, added to the treatment of patients with severe asthma with the goal of targeting the small airways and increasing anti-inflammatory dose. This would be added on to the use of a standard ICS LABA combination. The rationale for this is based on several proof of concept studies conducted in selected populations of patients with asthma, in which the small airways are shown by physiologic testing to have air trapping, and this may relieve this. 
but there are no, remember, there are no randomized control studies have been conducted in large populations that supports this approach. So in severe and difficult to treat asthma, now we're stepping up from genus step four to genus step five. The patient profile here is difficult to treat symptomatic asthma for more than two months with two or more exacerbations requiring oral corticosteroid despite the use of a high dose inhaled corticosteroid and both a LABA and LAMA long acting bronchodilator with optimal adherence. Here we have to now consider treatment targeted at the patient's specific phenotype or characteristics to help, to help guide their therapy. So we can use the asthma yardstick then to guide us in understanding allergic IgE asthma, eosinophilic asthma, neutrophilic asthma, airway smooth muscle hypertrophy. And we know the definition of each one. We will understand how biomarkers can be used and learn of what to do if, 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 in fact, those treatments do fail. So we know that this is a very busy slide. We know that the anti-IL-13s, both lebicizumab and trailicizumab, have failed in clinical trials and are not being developed at this time. We know that omalizumab uh, it blocks IgE and also depopulates uh, high affinity receptors on mast, mast cells and basophils. We know in the bottom right-hand corner that as teotropin works on, on airway smooth muscle, bronchothermoplasty also works to downregulate the reactivity of airway smooth muscle. We now have three anti-IgE preparations that are available, that will be available in the United States. Mepilizumab, Resolizumab, and just two days ago, Benlorizumab was approved for the treatment of, IG, of, of IL-5 eosinophilic asthma. Dupilumab has been approved for use in atopic dermatitis, but is not approved yet for asthma care. The company will be filing for that indication uh, early this next year. Dupilumab blocks the IL-4, IL-13 axis and appears to be more efficacious than the two IL-13 blockers that have not, are not being studied in asthma at this time. So as you can see on the top of the slide, these mediators are upregulated by allergen exposure, viral exposure, irritant exposure. All this can lead to very significant upregulation of the asthmatic reaction. So first, we know that uh, we can target IgE. Omalizumab has been available in the U.S. market uh, for 15 years. It is now approved down to six years of age. It's for difficult to treat characteristics of asthma, moderate or severe. We have a total IgE in adults between 30 and 700. In children, uh, uh, they have an IgE of 30 to 1,200. And they have to demonstrate a specific uh, IgE sensitivity to a perennial allergen. These patients are at step five therapy. Omalizumab can be added, and a three-month uh, therapeutic trial is recommended to see if the patient is going to respond. The persistence response after therapy, the benefit and persistence response in subjects continuing withdrawing from long-term treatment with omalizumab uh, patients have been on lizumab for up to 15 years, actually, this slide says five years. In a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled studies, the primary outcome was, was protocol-defined severe asthma. And we, we know that there's approximately a 40% decrease in exacerbations. In patients who have the eosinophilic phenotype, this means they have an abnormal presence of an eosinophilic signal in the peripheral blood compartment and their airway compartment. So difficult to treat asthma with greater than 300 cells, uh, absolute eosinophil count, two or more exacerbations, or a history of at least 150 cells and three or more exacerbations. And also it's very helpful if they have an elevated exhaled nitric oxide to show they have an eosinophilic signal in their airway compartment and their peripheral blood compartment. An anti-IL-5 anti 
medicine can be used, as I mentioned, there are three of those, and a three-month trial is recommended. So both mepolizumab, and, which is a subcutaneous product, resolizumab, which is a weight-based IV product, all bind, IG, uh, bind IL-5. Benlorizumab, which was just approved this week, binds to the receptor uh, on eosinophils. It causes ADCC, which is programmed cell death, and also decreases IL-5 concentrations. These lead then to a significant decrease in exacerbation rate. The exacerbation rate uh, reduction with mepolizumab versus placebo increased progressively as their eosinophil count increased. 52% in patients with a baseline blood eosinophil count of 150 and 70% decrease with at least 500 cells per, per cubic liter. So in a baseline count less than 150, the predicted efficacy of mepolizumab was definitely reduced. In neutrophilic asthma, which I mentioned earlier, is a very difficult uh, uh, nut to crack. These are patients who have neutrophilic infiltration in their airways. They don't respond to high-dose inhaled steroid. They have multiple comorbidities, and they don't have the markers that are associated with a response to therapy. One can consider a long-acting antimuscarinic in these patients and also adding a trial of macrolide antibody. And again, at least a three-month trial is recommended. This uh, macrolide antibiotics have been used in panbronchiolitis in uh, elderly Japanese males. We've been using in cystic fibrosis for two decades now. It's used in COPD. But now more data is emerging that patients with a neutrophilic asthma phenotype may be helped with macrolide antibody. And in, in uh, a recent study that was published uh, in uh, Lancet this year from Peter Gibson's group in um, Newcastle, uh, New South Wales, Australia, this was a 48-week study. 500 milligrams of azithromycin was given on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The mean reduction in asthma exacerbations uh, dropped from 1.86 to 1.07, and severe exacerbations from 1.07 to 0.61. So there was a significant drop in exacerbations. And it's very important that this worked in both eosinophilic and non-eosinophilic asthma. So this is new information since this meta-analysis was done. It is important to realize that in patients treated with either 500 milligrams of azithromycin uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or 250 every day, that uh, macrolide-resistant or pharyngeal uh, organisms can occur and also uh, hearing impairment can occur, and both of these need to be monitored. But azithromycin can reduce the rate of severe exacerbations in patients with, uh, again, non-TH2 and TH2 asthma. So, although the 2015 meta-analysis uh, did not show that macrolides had a significant benefit, this new evidence does point us toward the fact that macrolides may be a significant uh, value-added uh, adjunct to the therapy for many of our patients with severe asthma. Airway smooth muscle hypertrophy is a significant problem. We have beta agonist bronchodilators that are short-acting and long-acting. We have long-acting antimuscarinics. But for patients who have very severe airway hyperreactivity. That is, these are patients who smoke, change in barometric pressure, noxious uh, like perfume, cleaning fluids, et cetera, walking down the detergent aisle in, in the uh, grocery store will lead then to a significant uh, increase in bronchial hyperreactivity. 
So patients with difficult to treat asthma who don't qualify for other targeted TH2 therapies or have tried and, tried and failed those targeted therapies may be eligible to demonstrate, uh, may be eligible to have bronchial thermoplasty where the three treatments are given. Both lower, uh, both upper lobes are treated in one treatment and two other treatments do each of the right and left lower lobes. It is a very important adjunct that can be used in very selected patients who have significant bronchial hyperactivity. Most of these patients have tried and failed a um, uh, biologic and are on high dose inhaled corticosteroid. So not, it's done through a bronchoscope, as I mentioned. There's a radio frequency uh, heated uh, to 65 degrees centigrade, and it's done by a catheter is passed through the bronchoscope. It's done in three separate settings and has a 5 to 10% chance of increasing airway hyperreactivity during the time that the uh, uh, procedure is done. The most common side effect then is temporary worsening, as I said. The side effects typically occur within a day of the procedure and resolve within a week. There's a risk about 3.5% uh, of these symptoms require hospitalizations and events uh, were, were typical of airway irritation including worsening of asthma symptoms and upper respiratory tract uh, infections. But there is no evidence that airway fibrosis is seen associated with bronchial thermoplasty in their five-year follow-up studies to show that. So we need then to have awareness of appropriate treatment. We need for greater awareness and understanding among patients, caregivers, and uh, policymakers that the appropriate therapy needs to be done. The CHESS Foundation and network campaign tools are, uh, are used. We also need shared decision making. This is a very important uh, to get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. There are ongoing uh, groups who are developing the shared decision making tools for both adult asthma and then we're going to do it in pediatric asthma. This is a very important uh, uh, undertaking, and it's a com combined effort of the CHESS Foundation Asthma and Allergy Network and also the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So we need to take control. We need to know that we have uh, good websites where we can use traditional media, social media, radio media tour, lifetime TV, and microsites to all to uh, uh, allow the public to really understand how to approach and treat asthma. We have a severity assessment tool, control tools that are available, a shared decision making tool, and more patient and healthcare provider education will occur in 2018. So we need a consistent message here. We need no symptoms, we need no oral steroids, no ER hospitalizations, no nighttime awakenings, no loss in school work days, no exercise limitations, and no medication side effects. In conclusion, severe asthma is a significant global burden in the healthcare arena. Poor asthma control leads to poor quality of life, leads to high direct and indirect healthcare costs. The asthma yardstick is a comprehensive update on how to conduct a sustained, a sustained step up therapy in asthma with a not well or poorly controlled asthmatic. And with all new therapies for severe asthma, clinicians need guidance for the right treatment at, for the right patient at the right time. And with greater awareness and, and shared decision making will lead to these things occurring. So, so thank you. To end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Donnie, would you like to add anything? 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Tripps. That was a great job and, and certainly appreciate your in-depth overview of the asthma yardstick and also for highlighting the efforts of the College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, Chess Foundation, and the network to work collaboratively to address this issue of severe asthma. Uh, with that, Sally, we'll turn it back over to you and, and field any questions that may come from the audience. Okay, and we do have several, so here we go. First question is, a student insists that laughing is his or her trigger for asthma. Every time the student laughs, he or she starts coughing and wheezing. Is this possible? Yes, it most certainly is. Even laughing, a forced expiratory maneuver like doing a, sp a sp spirometry or a peak flow test in the office, all can show, can cause increased bronchial hyperreactivity, airway smooth muscle hyperreactivity and wheezing, and that patient needs at least a long-acting beta agonist and maybe a long-acting beta agonist and, and a long-acting anti-muscarinic. Thank you. Um, someone wrote a question about some of the new biologics and wondered if these are approved for children. The only biologic approved down to age six is omalizumab. Both mepolizumab and benlorizumab are approved down to age 12, and resolizumab is approved down to age 18, along with bronchothermoplasty. Okay, so many new treatments. It's really an exciting time to be in the field of asthma. Another person writes in and says, how do you differentiate allergic versus eosinophilic asthma if an uncontrolled patient has both allergies, high IgE, and elevated eosinophils? What biologic would you start them on? That's a $64,000 question, <laughs> something I, I, I struggle with every day. If a patient has a very significant eosinophilic signal, in the peripheral blood compartment, meaning an eosinophil count over 300, and concurrently an exhaled nitric oxide over 50 while taking an ICS and LABA, then they're candidate for an anti-IL-5, either one of the two subcutaneous preparations, mepolizumab or benlorizumab, or the IV preparation, uh, resolizumab. If they don't have as robust a signal in the airway compartment, and they have very positive allergy skin tests, and they are troubled by hay fever in the spring or fall, and of course they have concomitant asthma, that would lead me to using omalizumab. Well, there you go. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is, how long do you treat with the macrolide? Macrolide treatment can go on for years. I do a, at least a three or four month uh, trial of therapy to see if they're going to respond and then we'll continue them and reevaluate that every six months but there is no outside limit for how long it can occur but the treatment can occur as long as hearing loss is not occurring or resistant organisms are not uh, found. That's fascinating. Uh, the next question says, are we able to get handouts of the presentation? And I can answer this one for you. Uh, we do not share the handouts of the slides because a lot of times our presenters are continuing to use the slides in different presentations at different conferences. But we will be um, recording this. We are recording the presentation and it will be on our website in about 48 hours. And at that point, if you have questions on something you missed or you want a clarification, you would be able to go back and view the, the presentation again. This is just a good time. We have a few more questions, and if you have any more, now's the time to write them in. But just a quick reminder that if you want a certificate of attendance for this, uh, if you're listening live, we can only give you a certificate if you're listening live. And if you are, please go to the control panel for go to webinar right now and print out your certificate before the end of the webinar. After that, it won't be available. But look for handouts, and you'll find a certificate of attendance. Our next question is, are other llamas approved for pediatric use besides, I'm going to say it wrong, teotropium? I think I got that close. Teotro teotropium is the only one approved down to age six. It is approved in the 2.5 microgram dose 
down to age six. For seal for COPD, it's approved in the five microgram dose. Uh, the rest are approved only for 18 and above. Okay, uh, the next question is, I have difficulty convincing parents that children who cough after sickness that seem to linger more than most and have night awakening that their child might be experiencing signs of asthma. I get a lot of pushback. Any suggestions? Yes, I would first, you have to point out to the patient that the old adage, you know, if you treat a cold, it lasts a week. If you ignore it, it lasts seven days. If it's gone to 14 to 21 days, still having persistent cough. If you measure, you can measure their lung function. I also in my office measure their exhaled nitric oxide. And then you can give them a trial of low dose inhaled steroid. And if that turns off their cough very quickly, that is surely indirect evidence that asthma may be operative. Alternatively, if the parents are totally resistant to using inhaled steroid, at least give them a trial of short-acting and uh, uh, bronchodilator, mm -hmm. such as albuterol, and to see if there's a salutary response to that. Yeah, and Sally, this is Tanya. I, I would also suggest, you know, oftentimes these parents are just fearful of that chronic disease diagnosis and, you know, helping to address the fears and anxieties and, and really getting to the bottom line through a shared decision-making process of what those fears and anxieties may be and why the parent is so resistant to that potential diagnosis um, can certainly help to foster trust and a more open dialogue and communication toward getting to the appropriate diagnosis. Thank you, th thank you so much. Um, then our next question is, can you recommend any books about medications for asthma care management? Uh, I can. <laughs> uh, so at Allergy and Asthma Network, we have developed a very nice uh, resource that is intended specifically for families and caregivers, and it's Understanding Asthma, and there is a specific section just on the medications that explains it in patient-friendly language uh, about a sixth grade health literacy level. And then we also have a four-page guide that was co-developed between the network and uh, CHEST Foundation that, again, would be happy to send out that you can share with your patients. And uh, people, if you're wondering how to uh, get something like that, you can either go to our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org or you will be getting my email uh, in a follow-up email from this webinar and you can always let me know what I, how I can direct you. So if you're looking for resources, always find a way to ask us because we're right there for you. Here's our next question. What does the patient administer first, teotropium bromide or their LABA? If their lava is from Adderall, which is the most commonly used one, I would do that first. If their lava is uh, Berlanterol, uh, Olodaterol, or Salmeterol, it doesn't matter which one do is done first because they both have a, a prolonged onset of action. So if they have from Adderall with short-acting bronchodilator that works quickly, I would do that first. Okay. Uh, 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 our, our listener clarified her question, said she was looking for books for healthcare providers. So uh -huh. it, do we have, well, it, I'm glad, still glad we mentioned understanding asthma, but, uh, but if, if is there's any recommendation on a book for a provider, that would be great. Well, you know, the problem with books are that by the time they're published, they're already out of date. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're better to use the review articles that are present, such as the asthma yardstick, which has up-to-date dosing recommendations. And uh, there also are ERS, uh, ATS ERS guidelines for treatment of asthma exacerbations, for assessment of asthma exacerbations. And uh, using those together, I think, gets the best answer. That's great. Things are changing quickly. Uh, our next and on the medication guides, I would also point out that we do update those every three to six months. So they are reflective of the most recent approved products. Great. Uh, uh, our, another question is, how young of an age will eosinophils be able to be detected in a child? 
Well, you can detect eosinophils in a two and three year old all the time. And in fact, we are going to start uh, very soon a study in two to four year olds using omalizumab as a, a disease mod as hopefully a disease modifying agent. So the eosinophilic uh, endotype for asthma may be a significant uh, problem even uh, very early in life. Okay, well, thank you so much. Our next question is, is the yardstick meant to replace the outdated NHLBI guidelines? Well, <laughs> I'm trying to be politically correct here. It is meant to augment the guidelines and give up-to-date information. How about that? That sounds Please wonderful. Well, we're, we don't have any more questions today, but several people wrote in and said thank you for the updates and thank you so much for the in-depth presentation. So I, I, I'm very appreciative to both of you for all of your input today. So if you could advance the next slide, we'll finish up for today. I'd like to encourage you to be sure to register for our December webinar on December 13th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be sharing information on chronic urticaria. Next slide will show you that Allergy and Asthma Network is offering a new resource to you. It's a three to five minute video post of our popular Ask the Allergist series. You can find it on our website under News and Views. Click on Ask the Allergist. Last month's question was on stepping down asthma medication, and we release a new post each month. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyandasthmanetwork.org. For December, look for education in the horizontal navigational bar near the top of the page. Scroll to webinars. You can also view our archived webinars on this page of our website. And if you can advance the slide one more time, I encourage you to visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you register to be with us next time on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. For the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network, we wish you a great and a healthy day as we work to breathe better together. Thank you. Thank you.